Thanks for coming in. It's it's such a beautiful day. I sort of assumed that you guys would have gone over to Bartos and then just sort of decided to go like sit by the Charles for the rest of the day. So I appreciate you um, coming by and saying hi. Uh, my name is Ethan Zuckerman. Uh, I teach over at the MIT Media Lab, uh, which is where you were just hanging out. Um, let me just say, uh, at an extremely practical conference where people are learning lots of wonderful things about this amazing system, this is a hugely impractical talk. Um, but I'm hoping that we can be impractical for a couple of minutes to sort of talk about some ideas that I, I think actually inform the work that all of us do, or, or I kind of hope inform the work that all of us do. I want to tell a, a story or two, and then I, I hope we have a little bit of time for a conversation. So let's see where that goes. Um, but you may have noticed that I'm, I'm starting this talk with an image of Andy Warhol. And it's, it's to evoke this idea that I think is quite famous by now, that in the future we will all be famous for 15 minutes, um, which has certainly been more than true for Warhol. What most people don't realize is that it's quite possible that your fame for 15 minutes may be total infamy. Uh, it may be basically people around the world hating your freaking guts. Uh, and that's an experience that I've had, and it's actually taught me a lot about my work as a developer, and nowadays my work sort of as a software architect, as, as, as a teacher, and, and really about technology and ethics more broadly. This is a story that, that starts for me a, a, a very long time ago. Um, my, my glory days as a developer were really from about 1994 to about 1997. Um, thank goodness no one actually lets me write any code these days. Um, but way, way, way back in the days, I was helping write uh, a software platform called Tripod. Uh, does anyone remember Tripod? Hands up. This is the only room where you would get more than one or two hands up for tripods. So I, I, I want you to head back into 1994. I dropped out of grad school. I moved back to my hometown of Williamstown, Massachusetts, where a couple of friends had this idea, what if we started a website that would focus on um, helping people basically have life after college. So if you look at what our homepage looked like, we wanted to help you get a job, we wanted you to travel, you know, we wanted you to have a good time. And then kind of sneaking in over here, if you see this little link down here for homepage builder, this is something that came up in the middle of the night. One of my developers had this idea. We'd put up a resume builder. You could put together your resume. It would export to PDF. This was really cool in 1995. We figured, you know, the same thing. We would just let you have a little bit of space on your server. It would be behind a tilde. You could put up your own home page. Wouldn't that be cool? And in 95, that was actually pretty cool. And suddenly, we had a whole wave of people creating beautiful works of art. I mean, clearly, like, wonderful. So we looked at this, and we felt about it roughly the same way that you did. Like, OK, this is a nice thing to do for our users. But who really gives a crap about this? So, so, and we had the bling tag, we supported it, we, we, we made it automatic. Um, I, I suspect that that under construction probably blinked as well, uh, and, and I'm hoping the text did too. So it turns out that when you let users generate content like this, each individual piece is not particularly interesting, but when you put a whole mass of it together, you actually have a, a different business model. Um, you have the business model that, that is now, in many ways, the dominant business model of the internet, which is the model of user-generated content. So we found ourselves sort of in the middle of being basically whipsawed by this rise of the next internet movement. We were paying lots and lots of money to people to write articles on, here's how to get your first mutual fund out of college. Here's how to find a great apartment in Boston. And the truth is what people wanted to do was build these home pages. And so we figured it out. We got to the point where we sort of retooled ourselves and figured out how to be a very, very different website, how to let you have your home on the web. But it was an awkward and difficult process. The first piece of the awkward and difficult process was looking at our server logs. When I had set up our server logs, I didn't log any of these tilde pages because I assumed that no one would look at this crap. And the first time I found out about this was when my bandwidth provider called me up and said, I just have to warn you, 
your bill this month is 10x what it was the previous month. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? What's going on? And he sat down and showed me his server logs, which suddenly had 90 times as many people coming to my website as it had come the moment before. You may look at this and sort of go, oh my god, like who lived on this web? We were the number eight site on the internet in 1998. We had 15 million users putting up home pages, and we had somewhere around 50 or 60 million people visiting them on a monthly basis, which at that point was utterly huge. So there's another thing to point out. You can see at this point how we were trying to monetize, right? We were throwing up ads, we had text ads, we'd put all of this stuff up here, trying to figure out how to make some money off of this. That didn't happen automatically. When we started this, we simply put up these pages, we didn't bother trying to make any money off of them. Then we realized this is a problem. We're gonna have to make some money off of this. Our bandwidth bills have gone through the roof. We did the simplest possible thing. We put an ad banner on the top of it. And that seemed great. Suddenly we had a huge amount of ad inventory. We were gonna go out there, we were gonna make a ton of money. And then there was one little problem. When you're working with user-generated content, you don't have any control over what the user generates. So let's fast forward to 1996. We have ad sales guys. One of my ad sales guys is out visiting Ford Motor Company. He's showing off the work that we're doing. He's flipping through the home pages, and he finds a Ford ad on top of a page, and he's like, great, I can prove that this is doing the work. And then it turns out that the page is an enthusiastic celebration of gay sex. And Ford is not particularly happy about this. And Ford makes very clear to them that they're not happy about this. And he calls my CEO and says, why the hell did our you know, ad rep find a Ford ad on top of a gay sex page? Why are we hosting an explicit gay sex page? Now, I, I want to point out that there's a couple of things that I should have done at this point. right? The first is, any time you're running user-generated content, do not put in a random page button. Really bad idea. Just don't do it. It's too easy to write. Please don't do it. It's just a terrible, terrible idea. Please learn from my mistakes. Second, what this pointed to is a problem that no one solved, which is how do you monitor content in a user-generated community? Facebook deals with this every freaking day, and they don't do it all that well. You know, they have a, quite a small team proportionate to the size of their company. It's something like 900 people on staff and then a much larger group that they're outsourcing to. They do a lot of algorithmic filtering, which is how you end up with stories like the girl burned with napalm showing up in a Pulitzer winning photo getting banned for child porn despite the fact that it's basically an incredibly powerful symbolic image. They've never figured it out either. We didn't figure it out either. We figured out a way to get rid of some simple pornography. We looked for flesh tones and JPEGs. We reviewed the rest of it. But at this point, with my boss breathing down my throat, all I could think about was, how do I get that ad off the flipping user's page? JavaScript's brand new at this point. It's just come out. New functions are being added every day. We're sort of writing functions when we don't have them. I remember earlier in this writing my JavaScript random function because it wasn't in the language at that point. Someone invents the window open method. We can create new windows. And I figure this is my solution. The user can have their page. We're not going to interfere with it at all. When that window opens, I'm going to open another window. It's going to have a navigation console. It's going to have information about what tripod is. It's going to help you move to other pages, find page building tools, and it will have a small ad in it. My friends, I invented the pop-up ad. <laughs> Let me first say, I'm so sorry. <laughs> really, like, I, I, I'm, I'm so very very sorry. Let me also say, however badly you are feeling about me right now, whatever harm you would like to do to me, believe me, worse has already been said. In fact, I'm going to prove.
let, let me just say that was a really weird week. Um, I, I, so I went off the internet for about a week. Uh, and I went off for, for, for good reasons. I was getting death threats. Um, and uh, let me just sort of say, like, this is not me crying crocodile tears here. I, I generally speaking, like a bad week for me on the internet is what you know, most women online call Monday, right? I mean, you know, the level of harassment that's fairly standard for women in the tech industry is way, way higher than what I got. You know, I got a few people wishing me bodily harm and ill. Uh, I warned the local authorities. Uh, I also got a lot of good-natured ribbing. But I also got a lot of people who were genuinely upset about what I had done and, and, and really personally blamed me for this. And I spent a bunch of time sort of thinking about this and essentially going, the first version of this essentially says, like, come on, you know, someone else would have figured out how to put an ad in a window. And in, in fact, you know, we watched our competitors over at GeoCities literally grab my JavaScript code and, and sort of cut it and paste it into their page before they figured out how to sort of refine their own. Um, so obviously, it was, it was going to happen. There are some bad ideas whose time has, has simply come. Um, but the more that I thought about it, the more that I actually thought there's a much deeper problem here. And the deeper problem was not so much where we put the ad. It was our utter and total failure of imagination about how we might support the internet, right? So again, 96, right? Commercial internet has only existed really for two years. 94 is the year that the web sort of comes into most people's consciousness. Anything was possible. And what we ended up with was something that was so bad, so lame, that we're stuck with today, which is essentially a system for monetizing this thing that we all love that's just pathetic in that it's completely counter to what our users want. It's completely counter, for the most part, to what our advertisers want. And I've spent a lot of my time lately sort of thinking about this question that technologies have politics. So this is from a graphic novel about Robert Moses. Who's heard of Robert Moses? Cool. For those who haven't heard of Robert Moses, Robert Moses is one of the either great figures or great villains of the 20th century. Moses was in charge of most of the city planning for the city of New York. He ended up sitting on a whole set of boards that had to do with the shape of how New York came to be. And Moses had this very particular vision of how New York City should evolve. He really believed that there should be this sort of dense business core in Manhattan and that everybody else should live out in the suburbs, and that the suburbs should basically be parks. So Queens and Brooklyn, they should be beautiful, but everyone should commute in via car. And one of the things that he really wanted was a giant expressway through lower Manhattan that was going to be 10 lanes wide. And this put him in conflict with a woman named Jane Jacobs, who basically said, hey, in building this, you're going to destroy this beautiful, organic city that I've grown to love. And this is one of the great debates, not just in sort of urban planning, but actually like in technology as a whole. How should we think about how we build our cities? Should they be built organically? Should they be built for the top down? You can spend your whole life just studying Robert Moses. Like there's enough in this man's story and on his shape on New York City that people have made entire careers out of studying the guy. One of the big things that people have studied is Robert Moses and bridges. So when Robert Moses ended up designing these parkways, designed to bring people out into the outer boroughs of Queens, designed to bring them out to the beautiful beaches of Long Island, he designed these parkways with very low bridges. Most of these bridges have overpasses that only accommodate a vehicle about eight and a half feet tall. Most city buses in New York City are 12 feet tall. This turned into a giant argument in the field of science and technology studies, which I occasionally teach in, called Do Artifacts Have Politics? Beautiful article, highly recommended. A guy named Langdon Winter writes this in 1980 and basically says, the technologies that we build have politics embedded within them. 
when Robert Moses decided to design these parkways, he was designing them for very specific people. He was designing them for comparatively wealthy people who had their own private cars, who would live out in the suburbs, enjoy these parks, enjoy these beaches, come into Manhattan, but he was not designing them for poor people, he was not designing them for black people, he was not designing them for people who were taking public transit. So these technologies have built into them a sense of who they were for and the politics behind them. Now, you'll note, I didn't say that Robert Moses was a racist. That's where most people go with the story. Most people essentially say, Moses was racist, he didn't like black and brown people, he built the technologies to ban them. I wouldn't go nearly that far. I think what happens when technologies have politics is that the politics are a lot more subtle. They are not that you are Democrat or Republican, they are not that you are left or right, they are that you are making certain assumptions of what people are gonna do with your tools and you usually aren't conscious of what those assumptions end up being. So let's talk about another place that technologies have politics, Facebook. One of the big things that Facebook did in let's call it the second wave of user-generated content, right? The first wave, folks like me, folks like GeoCities, here, come have a space of the web. Frankly, we don't care who you are. Just come, come. We'll figure out how to make some money off of you. My best users, as it turned out, were Malaysian political dissidents because there was no other way to publish political content in Malaysia at that point. So they flocked to our platform. We ended up hosting the entire Reformasi movement through the 1990s before Anwar Ibrahim ended up in prison. Facebook looks at this and goes, Tripod is a sewer. Like these people are creating content, there's no authority over it, we gotta clean this up. The best way we can clean this up is we should find out who's using this tool. We want people's real names. This seems like a really good idea. People will treat each other better if there's no anonymity, if we know who everyone is. Who is real name policy bad for? It's really bad for drag queens. It's really bad for people who don't use their real name in everyday life, who use a different and an alternative identity. Who else is it really bad for? Anyone know who this is? Wael Gonim. Wael is an Egyptian software developer. He's running a Facebook group called We Are All Khaled Said. Khaled Said is a man who gets beaten to death by the Egyptian police. His Facebook page becomes the rallying point for the Tahrir Square movement. But Wael has a serious problem. It would be a really bad idea to be known as the guy running the Tahrir Square movement. So he's registering and trying to run this page under aliases, which Facebook keeps taking down. Finally, what Wael finally figures out is he finds an Egyptian friend in Canada who can run the group under his own name without Facebook taking it down and without him ending up in prison. I am not saying that Facebook is against drag queens. I am not saying that Facebook is against Egyptian protest movements. What I am saying is that when you make that decision that your policy is gonna be a real name policy, you end up affecting people that you probably didn't think about and you probably didn't imagine at the time because technology has politics. So if you go read my article in The Atlantic about this, ironically enough, you will get hit with a pop-up ad. And so I've been thinking about what are the politics of the ad-supported internet? What are, what's inherently built into the system that we don't think enough about? The first is the notion of an attention economy. So, crazy quote, Herbert Simon, brilliant social scientist, works in like 19 different fields. He gives a talk in 1971 where he says, as we head into the future, what we're really heading to is scarcity. And the thing that becomes scarce when information becomes rich is our attention. Every time you create a surplus of something, you're gonna create a deficit of something else, and what we're gonna have a deficit of is our ability to pay attention. Now, Simon is not reacting to the internet. No one knows what the internet is in 1969. He's reacting to that dreaded technology, the Xerox machine. 
Simon is an academic, and what he realizes is when other academics can Xerox off their papers and send him a copy of them, he is going to be flooded under stuff that he is suddenly obligated to read. And he is so freaked out by this, he stands up and gives an address where he warns about information overload. We are now well within this. The only thing that is scarce on the internet is our ability to pay attention to something. And what ads are is a demand on your attention. You want to do this. The ad wants you to do this. You really want to read my article because you go, this guy is sort of interesting. And suddenly the Atlantic wants to say, come claim your two free issues now. Ads are inherently conflicting with users' intentions online. Now, not all ads, right? Big difference between two kinds of ads. If I go into Google and say, hey, remember two years ago with all of that snow? My roof collapsed. Might be a really good time to try to fix that. I am telling Google what I want, and Google responds by saying, hey, here are some nice commercial roofing companies. By the way, if you click on one of those ads, it's roughly 10 bucks. Those qualified leads, like showing up as a qualified lead for a roofing contractor in the right area, 10 to $20, depending on what market you're in. It's one of the most expensive ads you can click on the web, because it's probably worth somewhere between two and $5,000 if you end up being a converted customer. But it's a very consonant ad. I've said, this is what I want. Google says, let me help you out. We feel pretty good about the experience. This ad on another one of my articles on The Atlantic, not so much. I'm not interested in conquering college. If anything, I'm really interested in making sure that my students don't use this service to try to get their way through my classes. And so in grabbing my attention away from my article and trying to help students subvert what I'm trying to do as an educator, they are trying to construct a desire. And this is why you know, shows like Mad Men are sort of interesting, because advertising is a fundamentally unheimlich field. It makes us uncomfortable. It's all about constructing desires that we don't yet have. And this is not to say that it's inherently unethical, but it is to say that it is in tension with what we're trying to do as far as seek out what we're looking for online. This tension's been very constructive. It's supported the newspaper industry as we know it. It's gotten the web off the ground. But it's a tension that always makes us competing for attention with what we're actually trying to put online. So ads don't work, right? How often does this ad get clicked? Display ads get clicked a vanishing percentage of the time. It has become very fashionable to say, yeah, web ads don't work, but mobile ads do work. Look at how often people click them. What is the last time any of you voluntarily clicked on a mobile ad? What is the last time you accidentally clicked on a mobile ad? All the frickin' time. We're not quite smart enough to figure out how to avoid them. We'll figure out how to avoid them. No one wants to pay attention to display ads. And so what's happening is we've had this incredible arms race that sort of says, oh, well, you didn't like this ad, but that's only because we don't know enough about you. Professor Zuckerman, if we just knew a little bit more about you, we would give you an ad that was exactly what you wanted. And at some point, you're going to like ads because we're going to know more about you. This is what Facebook knows about me. It's a lot. Some of it's not right. A lot of it is. Yeah, I do like books. Yeah, I study economic inequality. Yeah, I assign homework. Um, I have no idea what the hell's up with Wolverhampton City Hall, but like all the rest of this stuff is accurate because they're basically either pulling it out of my browser environment or they're pulling it from information that I've directly given to them. And even despite this, they're not able to give me particularly effective ads. I have seen more goddamn Donald Trump ads in the last couple of months despite the fact that they have accurately figured out that I am in fact very liberal and therefore very unlikely to come over. There's this arms race to sort of say, yes, we understand advertising totally freaking sucks, but we're going to make it suck slightly less than the other person. And the way that we're going to make it slightly less sucky is by taking in as much possible information from you as possible. And once we know absolutely everything about what you do and what you want, we'll be able to give you an ad that is not quite so awful. My friend Mishay Shaglowski calls this investor story time. 
he basically suggests that you think of it as the world's most targeted ad. It's designed to be clicked on by one person, which is to say a venture capitalist. So when you build a system that essentially says, hey, not only am I going to invite my users to share photos, but then I'm going to apply deep learning analytics to it, so you will understand what this user photographs, and we're going to combine that in a psychometric profile, and we're going to make it much, much more likely that we can target ads to that person. It doesn't matter if that shit works. All that matters is that some VC will write a check for $20 million. It's a targeted ad. The goal is to tell as best as possible a story to an investor, and it frickin' works. As he points out, you know, there's companies out there like Quora whose competition is Wikipedia. And now I'm just flat out stealing lines from Mache. But as Mache points out, Wikipedia has to run fund drives to keep losing money. And Quora is able to raise $80 million based on the idea that somehow, based on your question asking behavior, we will be able at some point in the future to target ads to you like no one ever has before. So it would merely be funny if it were not also corrosive. Because the same systems that we're using to figure out how to marginally better target an ad to you, those systems are being intercepted by the NSA. Literally. We know from Snowden's documents that some of the same information that's being used for ad tracking is now being used in surveillance systems. And for the most part, we are not out in the streets marching about this because in part, through my fault and everybody else from my first generation of the web, we are used to this notion that everything online is free and that what we pay for for it being free is with us. And we've simply accepted it and we don't review it the vast frickin' majority of the time. The real problem with this, and again, I'm just flat out stealing from Mache. Go, go watch his talk beyond Telerand. It's vastly smarter than anything I have to see today. Um, but he ends up arguing in some later works that the real problem is data as toxic waste. Who's got a Yahoo account? Who has had one over the years? Come on, everybody should have a hand up, right? They got compromised. They didn't let us know for two years. Where's that data now? I don't know. Does Yahoo know? I don't think they know. Yahoo at some point may offer a month off on a credit monitoring service. Gee, that's going to be helpful. All this data that gets locked up on these different platforms, this is monetized as an asset. But the other way to think about it is a giant liability that's out there. And that's information that's out there that someone can start using to impersonate us, to try to target us in ways more like a security service than like an advertising platform. Could we have done better? I suspect we could have done better. Here's a like casual late night list of other models that we might have dug into in a serious way when we were trying to figure this out in early 1996. There were people trying to build micropayment systems. And micropayments are hard because transaction costs are really high. But there's ways to think about this where you essentially store over a long period of time. You bill once a month. You might find a way to deal with this. Subscriptions. It was probably too early for subscriptions. We would have had a lot of people resisting paying money for this. But certainly at this point, subscriptions in many cases is a good way to go. We tried fee-for-service. We had some luck. With it, we got some people to upgrade. It's certainly much more realistic now. <clears throat> Mache runs a company called Pinboard. He does a one-time fee. You sign up for his excellent bookmarking service. It costs about five bucks. You never pay for it again. He has very good policies on where he goes with it. You can offer a lot of this stuff for free. You can put down a paywall and start you know, beyond that. One of the ones that I'm finding the most amazing right now is what I've started calling the love economy. I spend a lot of time listening to podcasts. I commute from Western Massachusetts. I drive all the frickin' time. That whole culture comes out of the public radio culture. Public radio in the US never had the opportunity to put down a barrier and say, no, you can't listen to this unless you pay more money. And so what they did instead was say, hey, you love us. We love you. Please help us keep doing what we do. Won't you give us some money and let us support this? And actually, it kind of, sort of, works. And there's amazing things 
um, like the Welcome to Night Vale podcast that I end up paying five bucks a month for, that's now ended up being this sort of international phenomenon, spawning other podcasts, putting out books, amazing, and really based on this sort of affirmative decision to support, rather than stealing my attention and demanding that I do it. Friends of mine are building self-monitoring systems. These are systems that you can put in your browser that track where you're spending your time and allow you to decide, are you going to donate money to the things that you support, to the things that you think are important? So what I want to suggest is that all of us, to one extent or another, are involved with building systems and putting them out in the world. And I just want to suggest some principles that I think help as we think about building systems that are better and fairer for the people that use them. Data minimalism. What do we actually need to know about the user? If we treat data as toxic waste, rather than as some sort of magical asset that we're going to monetize at some point in the future, how do we know as little about our user as conceivably possible? When we do know things about our user, what rights can we give the user to the data? At minimum, those rights have to include the right to review it and the right to delete it. You've got to find a way to get out of the system. None of this LinkedIn bullshit where you cancel an account and it's all still ready there when you come back six months later because they didn't remove anything. We got to think about interoperability. Everyone wants to lock users into their platforms. It's basically a way of preventing competition from happening. You want to make it possible for someone to take their data and move it to somewhere else because just having export without an interoperability right, it's not an actual right. It doesn't actually get you there. Transparency. So many of these companies don't tell you what their business model is. Their business model, if you can't figure it out, is you. You are the product. If you can't figure out what they're selling, they are selling you. And we have to be honest about what that model is so that people can make decisions about, is this company trying to help me follow my intentions, get done what I want to get done, or are they trying to trap me and use that data in a very different way? Why am I telling you this? For the most part, you are not necessarily people founding your own companies. But if you are, this is particularly important. When we build these systems, we are the people putting our politics into the tech that we are building. We're not the only ones. We're working with other people. Their values come into play. We're working within an ecosystem. The values of that ecosystem are enormously powerful. But we are in a position to advocate for users. And what I am asking people to do is think about those ethical decisions that go into building the systems that we build every day. Who does our tech make more powerful? Does it make our companies more powerful? Does it make our users more powerful? Is someone else empowered coming out of this? If you are running a company, I would argue that it is absolutely incumbent on you to be thinking about this in these terms. But even if you are a foot soldier, in the great Web 3.0 or wherever the hell we are wars, this is important as well. Because otherwise, at some point, some late night TV host is going to get up and make fun of you for some shockingly stupid decision you made 20 years ago because you weren't thinking about this larger question of what are the deep ethics and what are the deep politics of what you're doing. So I offer myself as a cautionary tale I hope I made your morning at least a little brighter, uh, if not provocative in some way. And I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation if we've got time. But thank you. Yeah, anybody? Yeah, please. Oh, interesting. Okay, so so the the just just repeating for the for the cast here, the the idea was that there's an essay that notes that a culture that feeds on ads is a culture feeding on its own excrement. I don't know the essay. I will say that, generally speaking, 
the most valuable things out there in life don't have to advertise. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever worked with consulting firms, but I, I used to do a lot of work with consulting firms, and what I would discover is that my clients were sort of shockingly mediocre. And I finally talked to the consulting firm, and they said, yeah, really great companies don't need consultants. Um, really great products tend not to advertise a ton. They tend to sort of build their buzz on their own. So in many ways, this sort of whole notion of let me try to build desire is very different from this sort of you know, intention-based ad advertising where really all you're trying to do is connect something, someone with something that they already want. So yeah, I'm not sure I would put it quite that way, but I, I actually am not going to disagree with that. Please. Wow. Classified ad, 40% of the revenue, sidewalks are going to come in. Patient shows, lights have all come out. Everything available on the internet. You know, Let's uh, move forward to last week. The newspaper put a report together saying that's entirely wrong. It's Paul, right? Yeah. So uh, Paul's wonderful wind-up for this question, right, is that inside Plone is tech that in many ways was designed to try to protect newspapers from the rise of the digital economy back in 94 and 95. Um, there's now an argument in the newspaper world that actually radically embracing digital was the worst thing they could have done, that actually if they had just stayed on the paper platform, uh, they, they might be in a stronger place. And I, I actually think that argument is probably right. Um, I don't think, I, I think a lot of these cats are very hard to put back in the bag, right? So I mean, I think the problem with this is that I don't think we're going to seamlessly pivot away from display advertising, even if everyone can agree that it's wretched and a bad idea. What I do think we can do is sort of look individually at the decisions that we're making right now and sort of take two decisions. One, we can sort of say, yeah, we've been down that path. Doesn't work so well. Let's not do that again. And then I think the other thing that we can do is sort of say, can we learn from the larger process? OK, yeah, maybe we should be digital. A lot of people are going there. But it looks like the revenue in digital is much lower. That's going to undermine our newsrooms. We have a civic duty on this. Let's not go too far down that line. It's possible that we could have made that decision differently. No, I don't. And and if we were doing this for the newspaper industry, you know, there are people writing articles that, that are like, here are 80 different models that you can do to do this. What almost no one wants to talk about is, you know, the models that actually work, which are some combination of donation-based, which is how really good journalism in the US tends to work, or state-supported, which is how really good journalism in Europe tends to work. And you can't say that in the US without you know, being dragged into the streets, particularly at this moment in time. But it's probably something that we're going to have to think about if we actually want news in a functioning democracy. No, tell me about it. Right. So, 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 and, and sorry, this is the Brave browser. So this is a browser that is integrating uh, ad blocking within it, but it's allowing you to monitor your own behavior and try to figure out where you're going to distribute money. I have a colleague over at MIT who's also working on a plugin, basically requires a single line of JavaScript 
on your site to be able to accept donations from this platform based on sort of monitoring your behavior and figuring out where to go. I mean, we need an enormous amount more thought on this. The whole ad serving industry is this giant multiple billion dollar industry with many, 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 many smart people trying to figure out how to raise the click rate on an ad that no one wants to click by some minuscule percentage. And it's an incredible waste. And if we could find some way to essentially say, yeah, ethically, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to look for other revenue streams. I run these days a, a, a modest sized website called Global Voices. It's basically a collective of about 1,500 people around the world reporting on what's going on in civic media and, and social media in their countries. We made a decision years ago not to take advertising. And we took it in part because it's just not appropriate with what we're doing. We've had to do other crazy things to make money. One of our best revenue sources is we run a translation bureau because so many people who are involved with our project speak English in another language. And so we actually run um, a, a very, very large fair trade translation service that helps support what we're doing. If you get rid of the easy and bad ways to make money, you start coming up with really interesting and strange ways to make money. Last question, because I know that we gotta we gotta go after this. Right. Can, can ad tech be used for social good? I think that there's ways to take advantage of systems that already exist and try to do good things with them. Um, but I think in truth, like the, the actual architecture of how ads work, we are programmed to learn how to avoid them. And I would so much rather people try to figure out how to create viral content to, to try to deal with things like trying to, to help people stay in school. I'm grateful for things like the Ad Council that try to give ad space to good causes. I'm happy to take advantage of them when they exist. I think at the end of the day, I think advertising the way that we know it now, I have a hard time believing that it's going to be a major economic force in 10 or 15 years. It's so badly aligned with what users want and frankly with what advertisers want. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>